Good evening and welcome to tonight's program hosted by the Commonwealth Club Silicon Valley. My name is Alison Van Diggelen. I'm host of Fresh Dialogues and a BBC contributor. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Hennessy, author of Leading Matters, Lessons from My Journey. Dr. Hennessy joined Stanford University's faculty in 1977. Over his career, he was chair of the computer science department, dean of the School of Engineering, university provost, and was later appointed as the 10th president of the school. Last year, he initiated the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program, the largest fully endowed graduate level scholarship program in the world. Dr. Hennessy is chairman of the Board of Alphabet and sits on the boards of Cisco Systems and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the American Philosophical Society. He has received numerous awards for his work in the field of computer science, including the prestigious 2017 ACM Turing Award with David Patterson. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Hennessy. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. My pleasure. Okay. So, Dr. Hennessy, I'd like to start by talking about your inspiration for writing this book, Leading Matters. You talk in the book about a crisis in leadership today in our government, in our corporations, and in our nonprofit organizations. Can you frame that? What do you mean by a crisis of leadership? Well, with respect to government, it kind of seems obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I, 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 we, we, bring up, um, we bring up our young people, our children, to tell them you don't call people names, you tell the truth. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily the role model they see right now in parts of our government. So I think we have a crisis there. Uh, corporations, I think we've had a variety of different crises. Ethical failures, focus on the wrong things. Um, and I, I think you've seen them play out in great companies, companies which were once great. Um, but I, even in the nonprofit world, I, I think looking at higher education, look at the number of institutions that have debased themselves in the interest of having a better football team. It's a university. It's not a semi-professional sports league. Let's remember what the real values of the institution are and hold those sacrosanct. Good. And you, you cite specifically Wells Fargo and VW as corporations that have taken wrong turns in their leadership. Can you itemize what they did wrong and what they've done recently to right the ship? And do you think it's enough? Well, I think what, what they did wrong began with probably something that was fairly harmless, was a fairly minor step, incentivizing uh, salespeople to push people to open new accounts and get new accounts, for example. Uh, in the case of VW, uh, can, we, can we maintain high air quality, meet the air quality standards, but actually get a little more mileage or a little more pep in the car, which I'm sure many of their buyers would like to have. But then it unraveled. Then another step was taken, another step was taken. It reminds me a bit, you know, when you look, go back, go back and look at the Enron story. Enron didn't go from good to deeply evil instantly. It was step by step. So this is one of the things we, we are go going to try to teach our scholars. Your, your ethical missteps don't unravel overnight. They begin step by step. One falsehood requires another falsehood, requires another falsehood, until the snowball has mounded into an avalanche and it collapses. I, I think they are trying to address the situation um, hard sometimes, it might require deep reform, lot, far more changes than perhaps are necessary because in any lor large organization, there's a chain of reports and lots of people in that chain probably knew what was going on. Can you restore confidence in the organization without rebuilding that entire chain of management? I think that's a tough question for companies like this. And how would you advise them if you were on their boards? <laughs> <laughs> I probably would have resigned from the board before this <laughs> moment, but 
<laughs> I, I would say it's it's a complete overhaul of the management chain. You you just need anybody who was directly responsible knew about it or should have known about it and was simply negligent in trying to see what was going on. Right here, no evil, see no evil is not an excuse. Um, I would say you have to overhaul that entire management chain. So by that you mean fire people? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I think you, they've broken trust with their customers. They've broken trust with their investor community because they've hurt the stock. They've broken trust with their own employees by putting them in a situation where they felt compelled to be dishonest. I think you have to, you have to overhaul the whole organization. Well said. Um, one thing that's top in my mind, because it was in the news today, is Elon Musk's leadership. He's now being um, accused by the SEC of uh, creating or making fr fraudulent statements over securing funding for taking Tesla private again. Uh, can you talk on that? He is he's someone that we all have admired for his innovation. He's been called the Thomas Edison of today. Where do you think his leadership has gone wrong in the last few months? Well, Elon is one of the most creative people I know. He is willing to take on really hard problems and find whole new solutions. You just look at the way he approached the design of the first Tesla car. Start from scratch. Don't assume any of the things that we're used to in internal combustion engines have to be followed. So you see a design that's completely electric from the, from the bottom up. Similarly with, sp with SpaceX and his activities in spacecraft. Managing a public company, being CEO of a public company, comes with a new set of responsibilities. Yes, you're still the technology driver, you're still the in person who's inspiring, but along with that come a whole set of requirements for you to be able, all of a sudden you have shareholders. And the reason he's in trouble with the SEC is because of the shareholders of that company. So I think you know, Ian, he, he, he had to make a decision. He was either going to focus on being the, the kind of innovator who's out there pushing the company to do incredible things, or perhaps he's going to be the, the leader of the company in a CEO sense, and somebody else is going to take over innovation. Hard to do both. It's possible, but hard. But certainly you can't be in a position of being the CEO of a public company and not take your responsibilities seriously. All right, and if you were on the board of Tesla today, how would you be <laughs> reacting to today's news and, and the whole you know, saga of we've had months of crazy irrational behavior? So I think, uh, w what do you do with the founder who's the heart and soul of the company and yet isn't behaving? Uh, I, think he needs, I think he needs a stronger board. He needs a board that's going to push back, going to coach him through this because he's a very capable and he is the inspiration of the company. But he needs a board that can push back. And I don't think his board has as much independence from Elon himself in order to push back the way they need to. Right. It'll be interesting to see how things develop. It will be. It will indeed. <laughs> what are your predictions? I, I, I think it's hard to predict. The SEC, whether or not there can be a settlement with the SEC, um, in many cases like this, the SEC has demanded that the individuals involved no longer be officers or directors in public companies for, that can ban you for 10 years. Um, whether or not they'll impose that, hard to say, but, um, but I think it's going to be a difficult conversation. Do you think Tesla will survive and thrive? I think, te I mean, Tesla is a great company. It now has to move from a great company that innovated to a great company that can produce product and begin to get enough revenue um, to really be successful. Sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. You know, we all admire what Steve Jobs did. Before the Macintosh, there was the Lisa. Anybody ever buy any Lisas? Anybody ever see any Lisas? It didn't work. Oh, somebody has one, okay, good. Uh, you saw it. <laughs> it didn't work. It was a failure, right? And, and indeed, Next was not an overwhelming success. Next was a failure as a, a, as a technology. Um, of course, he then came back and saved Apple, and that's really what made him a great innovator.
All right. So let's talk about your tenure as president of Stanford. It lasted 16 years, twice the national average for college presidents. Talk about what you learned from having that long tenure and a long-term view of your leadership there and what you achieved. And also talk about the, the, the perils of short-term thinking. Yes. That applies to corporations. As well as universities. Um, so when I, when I was getting ready to um, give my inaugural speech, I was sitting in the office thinking it was less than 100 years earlier David Starr Jordan, who'd been the first president of the university, was sitting here thinking about the future of the university. And he did a number of things which, which later on over many years enabled Stanford to thrive. So I thought really hard about that. What do we need to do as an institution? What's our opportunity? Where can we move into new fields um, where we can consolidate the things we've already done and think about doing something new? I've never been a storekeeper kind of leader. I'm not the person who you want to bring in if all you need to do is see the shelves get stocked and have everything run fine. I'm the one who's going to come in and try and do something uh, different. So I thought about that from the beginning, and I also reflected on the fact that I had an obligation not just to the current generation of students and faculty and staff and people in involved in the university, but to the students who would be at the university 100 years from now. I wanted to ensure that they would have a set of opportunities that were at least as good as the current set of students. So I thought a lot about that and the changing uh, nature. But I think that, that kind of long-term thinking, I think we've lost it, and we've lost it to some extent in the corporate world as well. Not only are we focused on shareholder return, but we're focused on shareholder return measured quarterly. And what does that do? It tends to align the management. And so then the board says, okay, since that's what matters, that's what we're going to measure to determine your salary and your bonus. So what happens is we tend to drive towards short-term focus. That may mean that the CEO and management team makes decisions which ensure the next quarter is great, but three years from now, we failed to invest in new products and the shareholders three years from now, as well as, importantly, the employees of the company and the customers are going to be let down because we're not going to have those new products. So I think we need to, we need to think more about how to incentivize that. You know, many years ago, corporations had a longer-term focus than they do today. They tended to protect and cherish their employees because of that. And part of what's happened is this relentless short-term financial focus, bottom line, has hurt things. It's one of the reasons that when Larry and Sergey um, decided to take Google public in the shareholder letter, it says, we will sometimes do things that are not in the best interests of the company in the short term in order to preserve and create long-term opportunities. And are you a fan of changing quarterly reporting? I would, love to, I, I would love to get rid of quarterly reporting and convert to yearly reporting. I think the other thing we could do, which would be tremendous, is to say um, long-term capital gains has a longer holding period. Maybe it's two, three years. And in fact, any stock held less than a year, you pay a tax if you sell it in less than a year. So we stop some of this current churn that goes on and fighting for very small changes in the price of a stock day to day, which don't benefit anybody. All right. Let's talk about fear. You write that you were, and I was quite surprised by this, given all you've achieved. <laughs> uh, you write, I was more than a little afraid, and you were worried you'd disappoint everyone when you were offered the position as president of Stanford. Talk about facing fears, and for anyone who's facing a new challenge, whether it's a new startup, whether it's a final exam, or whether it's a change in careers. How, how do you face your fears? How do you overcome these fears and, and hit those challenges? Well, certainly you worry about that. I mean, one, a piece of advice that I once got was if you think, if, if lots of people think you have the potential to do the job and you're concerned about it, you're going to avoid too many opportunities. You're going to be reluctant to do something different. Um, somebody once said, you know, starting a new job is like walking into a room you've never been in before. But there'll be doors out to other places and other parts of your life when you get in that room. 
It's not necessarily the end of your life. It's, it's one step in it. So I've always acquired that as, a, as an opportunity. You know, when I, when I was inaugurated as president, in fact, at the announcement, I had to give a short speech. It was the first time in my life that I had to get up and speak in front of the public without any visual aids. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a professor, especially if you're a computer scientist or engineering, every talk has slides or view graphs. Um, it didn't have it. So I had to master a whole new set of speaking uh, and, and ways of conveying my viewpoint and communicating with people. Um, it, it wasn't easy, it took practice, but uh, you get those opportunities. It's one of the reasons for our scholars that we're investing from the beginning in developing their ability to get up and tell about their story and their vision and where they're going. Any specific tips? Do you talk into the bathroom mirror or in front of your wife? G give us specifics. Practice, practice, practice relentlessly. There's a great story about Mark Twain, who, of course, became one of the great performers in the United States. In his very first uh, instance of doing a reading, he got stage fright. He froze for a minute. He didn't know what to do. And then all of a sudden, he got his focus. He picked out somebody in the audience. He looked at them, and he began talking as if he were talking to that individual, ignoring all the rest of the people in the auditorium. Now, of course, that established eye contact. It helped him relate to somebody in the audience, and he got over it, and he became a great performer as a result. Good tip. Yeah. Good tip. Here's a question from the audience, which is related to what we're talking about. What is your advice for someone who is not a leader, but wants to be a leader? So I think leadership is a skill you develop step by step. It's very hard to go from a rung on the ladder and skip over a lot of rungs and jump way up. We, we see what happens when you take somebody who ne has no political experience and tries to lead a country. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, it's very hard to do that because you haven't learned some of the difficult lessons, like how to say no to somebody and not make an enemy of them. That's a really important skill. How if do you, you want do that? to. First of all, you listen to their concerns. First thing, you listen. Everybody gets an input. Everybody gets to present a point of view. You listen to their concerns. You take them into account. You respect them. You respect their viewpoint. You try to sharpen your rationale on why you're not going to do what they would like you to do. And then you convey it in as humane and empathetic a manner as possible. And if you do it well, you at least don't make an enemy. They may not be happy with the decision you came out with, but they don't think you're crazy or that you're evil in some way. And, and that's critical. If you're going to lead for a length of time, that's absolutely critical. Because if you start building up enemies, you're just building up a reservoir which will eventually destroy your ability to lead. So I think leadership is step by step. It's putting yourself out there. It's finding that first opportunity. It's learning the skills on that and then if you do that well, other opportunities come along. Great. So in your book, uh, there's a chapter on confidence, and you say humility is the, pa is the basis of confidence. Can you explain why? I think humility is the basis of confidence because if you're humble, you don't have a problem saying to somebody who's working with you on your team, um, what do you think about this? What's your opinion? I don't know all the answers. I'm not the smartest person in the room on a broad set of subjects. Each of you has expertise. So humility makes it easy to say, um, what do you think? What's your professional? And bring in the talent of others. Humility has another important role. It, if you're humble, it's easy to say, I made a mistake. It's easier. It's never easy to admit you made a mistake. It's never easy, but it's possible to say it. And admitting that you made a mistake is the basis for recovering because, is there anybody in the room who's never made a mistake? <laughs> okay, so we've all made mistakes. It's, it's the ability to say, that was wrong, I was wrong. And I, one of the things I did with my team is I tried to make sure that 
everybody on the team was willing to say, you know what, John, that's a really stupid idea. If you do that, if you announce that or do that, you're going to regret it because it's not going to go over well. It's not going to be supported. Don't shoot the messenger. Listen to the message. Think about it and then, and then take it away. Great. So the great Walter Isaacson, the writer, he writes the introduction to your book. And he talks about the worst combination for a leader is big ego and insecurity. And, it, and he, <laughs> he writes, quote, as happens too often, especially in politics. <laughs> um, if you could sit down with our commander in chief, our president, what leadership advice would you give him? I, I guess I'd tell him that um, no matter how much he thinks he knows, he could bring in a set of people who would make him a better president. He has to learn to respect them, to cooperate with them, to listen to them. And if he could do that, I think he'd be a better president. He'd be a better president. And if you look at the, the people who've been really successful in political roles, they surrounded themselves with people who were real experts. I mean, even, e even Ronald Reagan, right, who was governor of California, that was his only real political experience. He was mostly an actor. Um, but he brought in a cabinet of really strong individuals, and he listened to them. He made the final decision. He didn't give up the right to make the final decision. But he listened to that cabinet, and I think that made him a better president. So let's talk about courage and facing challenges. Um, your advice is to, about facing challenges is don't personalize it. Can you explain what you mean by that? So many of the, uh, uh, Bill Gates once, I was talking to Bill Gates about leading Microsoft when he was still the CEO. And I said, Bill, what's really hard? I mean, it, you know, you've got all these complicated things, technical, financial. He said, the technical stuff, that's not so hard. The financial, that's not so hard. He goes, it's all people problems. And so many of the challenges you face in a leadership position are people problems. Um, and I think they arise from all kinds of things, from disagreements about perspectives from different people. Um, they arise sometimes because uh, some individual in the organization is more interested in their own success than the success of the organization. That happens in any large organization. You don't want to personalize it. So the, the provost and I developed a technique we would use when we got really angry about somebody's behavior. We would type out the email message and I would send it to the provost, John Etchemendi. I had the same provost for 16 years, which is one of the reasons we were able to lead the university for so long. I, he would send me back, he'd say, you're absolutely right, but don't send that message. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a release. I, I wasn't personal. I, I, didn't, I didn't implement the personalization. Uh, I was maybe focused on it. So I, I think you don't want to turn it into a battle between people. That, that just, you want to see when you can align things. How can you get closer to something that might work for a larger part of the community? All right. I saw an interview you did with the Wall Street Journal about your book, and you talk about these people problems being the biggest interrupter of your day. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask about, you have a chapter on empathy. Can you talk about how you deal with people problems, with empathy, mm. and with efficiency? Because as you say, they can be a huge time sink. They can be a huge time sink. So empathy for me... Um, when you're, you're leading an institution of the size of Stanford or the size of Google, for that matter, um, inevitably, employees have challenges in their lives. I it's inevitable. Students have challenges in their lives. How do you help them, support them to solve that challenge in an empathetic way that really says, you're an important part of this community, and what happens to you matters to me, and I want to see if we can't find a way to get through this. So, and people would have things happen. They'd have to, I need some time off to deal with a sick parent or a sick child or my own personal. And I gave people broad discretion in saying that. 
And I really only got in trouble once where somebody really took advantage of it. And then we had to have a separate discussion because their taking advantage of that was undermining their fellow employees. Then my empathy went to their fellow employees who were carrying extra burden because this person was not, uh, not living up to it. But I, I'm a big believer that empathy should help shape your worldview and your decision making. And for us, um, for me, getting to meet some of the students from really disadvantaged backgrounds who are on scholarships at Stanford and see them succeed at an institution where their family couldn't pay more than a tiny fraction of the tuition and room and board, seeing them go on to succeed made me a real believer in the importance of financial aid and the role it plays in providing opportunities for people independent of their family background. Yes, if you could share, I've, I understand that's one of your, the uh, achievements at Stanford that you hold dearest. Can you, can you share yeah, that so with the I, audience? I, I, had had a, I had had a number of encounters with students, and then we were worried about the fact that the number of lower-income students who were applying to the university was still quite tiny, much smaller than the number of qualified low-income students. And... You know, uh, the, uh, what you might ha ex expect happens in society. The odds of a student in a high-income family with high test scores applying to Stanford is much higher than the student who's in a low-income family that didn't have a guidance counselor, didn't have much access to college counseling, all these sorts of things. So we decided, we, we did some exploration, and we found out one of the problems was sticker shock. Families would look at, let's say back then, a total price, including room and board and tuition for a year of $50,000. And that's saying, and they'd say, that's what my family made in the last two years. How, I can't possibly apply because I couldn't even pay a fraction of that $50,000. So we made a decision. Simple. If your family makes less than $100,000 a year, your tuition is zero. Zero. So we made that announcement. And it is the single announcement on my presidency that got the most positive response from alumni. Lots of letters, comments, phone calls. They were really enthusiastic. And the interesting thing, of course, is you realize it wasn't children of Stanford alumni that were going to take advantage of that program. It was other people's children. But they believed in it because they believed that the opportunity it created for young people was really valuable. It's, it's a wonderful achievement. Yeah, it was great. So related question about empathy, et cetera, how, and I would ask, why do you, how can you lead well as an introvert? Are you afraid of being overbearing or controlling? Audience question. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I was an introvert when I started the job, I think. <laughs> Most tech people are sort of introverted. It's sort of a natural thing for techies. Um, I learned it over time. I learned it through a series of lessons. I learned it when, uh, when I started my first company um, and we were a couple years in and the company had expanded too fast uh, and we had, to do, we had to do a layoff. We had to lay off of 120 employees. We had to lay off about 40 people. So we made the decision of what, how we were going to do it. Of course, then you know most of the people being laid off. And the CEO... Uh, told me, okay, we're going to hand out the pink sleeps on Friday morning, Friday afternoon, you're going to stand up and tell everybody why this is still going to be a great company and why they should stay with the company. Uh, me? <laughs> me, the introvert, the engineer? He said, no, you, the founder. <laughs> you're going to stand up and do this. So I did it that, uh, because I, believed, I really did believe in the company. But that was a great lesson, learning how to communicate that communicated that even though we'd been through this difficult time, we were still all in this together and there was a great opportunity ahead of us. So it was a learning lesson. Those kinds of learning lessons, you know, you're a little afraid of them when they first come, but they're great opportunities to learn. Okay, as a leader, you face criticism. You yes, can't please uh, other absolutely. people all the time. Absolutely. And I read in your book, you fessed up, you've been called the worst boss in Silicon Valley. I was. During a student <laughs> protest. Yeah. What have you learned about dealing with criticism as a leader? Uh, well, first of all, don't believe all the press you read. <laughs> um, 
I, I think some of it you have to get used to. I mean, you never get completely used to it. Does it bother you? Yeah, of course it does. Um, you never get completely used to it. You have to, you have to adjust to it. You have to learn to take it with a grain of salt. Um, you have to ask whether or not there's something really there that you really do need to worry about. One of the, we had a set of students who went on a hunger strike and protested over uh, trying to get a living wage policy. And one of the things they were focused on was uh, subcontracted workers. All of our core workers were above uh, living wage standard, um, but they were focused on subcontractors. And, and one of the things we discovered is that there were some parts of this large university that had interpreted a set of university regulations that were intended to prevent taking advantage of workers in a way that was complicit with the letter but horribly violated the spirit of what the rule was. We had no idea. You, you just don't know in a large organization that somebody's off doing something. And the students, together with some of these subcontract employees, brought it to our attention. So we said, we have to fix this. You know, this is a legitimate, there's a legitimate complaint here. It's not something that is an attempt to uh, negotiate in a different way. So you have, to, you have to learn from that experience and then and be open to it and, and just try to do the best you can and endure the criticisms because they're going to come. They're going to come. Okay. I have a few. Okay. Just to prepare you. Uh, Stanford has been accused of having a gold rush mentality. Quote, the school now looks like a giant tech incubator with a football team. <laughs> it's a good quote. Can you respond to that? I know lo you're no longer president of Stanford, mm. but you know, I'm sure that overlaps with your tenure. Sure. I mean, we're, we're, we're not a, a tech incubator. We're a research university that happens to have invented some of the most important technologies that have been invented in the last 20 years. <laughs> um, in fact, most of those most of those technologies didn't, did not start out with the goal to create a startup. In fact, Larry and Sergey were not even working on web search when they started. They were working on a project to search digital libraries. That's how they began. And they discovered that some of the insights from searching digital libraries applied over to the web. Um, and in fact, the fact that that became a viable company, well, here they've invented this great technology. They're running it in the university basement. The university's internet is being overwhelmed by people who want to use the Google search engine, the prototype at that point. It's time for somebody to take that technology outside the university and run with it. So we're committed to the education of our students. I think we educate students for the long term. I do believe that if we have students who want to be entrepreneurs, we should teach them something about the basics of entrepreneurship because they shouldn't have to go through what I went through, which I was a complete babe in the woods. I couldn't read a balance sheet. I didn't know what a gross margin was. I didn't get a great deal with the venture capitalists as a result. I got an okay deal, but I didn't get a great deal. There were a lot of, I didn't hire the right people in the company because I didn't understand that. A little more education, I would have been a better founder. I probably would have saved $20 million of money that was invested. That $20 million is money that diluted the stock of all the employees. So had I been a better leader, all the employees in the company would have done better. That's a worthy uh, topic to teach people. Absolutely, and to talking of teaching people, audience question, do you think our education system does enough to teach morals and ethics and civic duty, especially public schools, K through 12, and private business schools? If not, how can we change that? So I think we, I, I believe quite strongly that moral, uh, morals and ethics are something that your parents embed in your, <laughs> in your core character. What we need to teach is how do you take your moral and ethical guidepost to work in the real world. In the real world where things are changing quickly and where you've got to make decisions and where slip, slippery slopes are the nature of the problem. How do you then get the compass? How do you bring your, your moral guidelines and your ethics to bear in that situation? Um, and I think there are special obligations around various professions. MBAs in business school, 
lawyers, we do, we do teach lawyers about, about ethics. They don't always necessarily hear the message, but, but we do teach them. We do teach them doctors and increasingly researchers in the biomedical field where we're going to face a lot of challenges. Big push now on teaching morals and ethics to computer scientists because with the rise of artificial intelligence are going to come many potential abuses of that technology. So we have to do a better job of teaching young people about how to use that technology appropriately. All right. Now let's move on to Google Alphabet. Mm -hmm. You're um, chairman of the board of Alphabet. And technology in the last few years, it's gone from, well, certainly uh, Google went from could do no ill to there's a serious tech backlash going on. Uh, due to unintended consequences of tech, fake news, privacy concerns, rising inequality, and our democracy being undermined. Do you feel Alphabet is doing enough to rein in the negative aspects of tech? I think probably w one of the things that happened in the tech sector, I think, is nobody adequately understood how big the change was coming and how rapidly it would come. So that these products of these companies, whether it be Facebook or Google or, or Twitter, become used by people, um, particularly younger people, uh, at levels of intensity that we just didn't completely foresee. That together with um, the fact that the internet makes everybody a potential publisher, good and bad, um, the fact that we've created some echo chambers. Of course, we have echo chambers in the traditional media, right? Fox News is one echo chamber, and MSNBC may be another, right? Uh, and depending on your viewpoint, Fox News is fake news, or MSNBC is fake news. Or maybe they're both somewhat opinion and news mixed together. Um, so I think we have issues there. I think we should be able to distinguish by looking at authority and, and the validity of standing for a, big, for a news source, what's likely to be true from what's false. Separating opinion is a much more difficult thing and that will require a, a, a subtlety. Um, I think we also need, the tech industry needs a better job of communicating. Communicating what data it has, how it uses that data, how you as a user can eliminate or restrict it um, if you want to. We need to do a better job on, on all those fronts. Um, we're given a lot of responsibility now. We have a lot of information about people in the tech sector. We need to use that information responsibly. And what have you done as chairman to underline the importance of user trust, people who use Google? So the first thing we do, and the most important core principle for Google is that Search is inviolate. Nothing, political bias can never enter. We try to always deliver with search the most likely website that we think you're looking for. That's what we try to do. It doesn't always come out right, but it, it comes out pretty well. Um, and, and we don't let political bias or other biases influence that search process. And that's a critical issue for the company because if, if you lose that, then people don't believe your search results anymore. Great. So you write in your book about, I mean, you have straddled both sides. You've straddled a university setting and the corporate world. Talk about that conflict that you explore in your book between deep research mm. to create, you know, moonshots, if you like, and that corporate requirement to make a dime. Or yeah. A million dimes. Yes, exactly. Or a billion dimes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, or a trillion, right? Yes, You're it's a lot. It, it, it's a lot. It's a lot. I think the way to, to put it in context is after 125 years, Stanford's endowment is equal to one quarter of Google's annual revenue. That just shows you. Uh, in the time uh, I was president of Stanford for 16 years, uh, the university budget grew by 3x over 16 years. It was one of the fastest growing university budgets in the U.S. Um, Google's budget in the 14 years since it went public and I joined the board and today has grown by 35 times. 
So corporations are moving an order of magnitude faster, a fast-growing corporation. Um, so that creates real distinctions in how they can focus. And universities are really about the future and about trust and discovering the future and investing in things that are discontinuities, right? I see Jessica pointing, one of our scholars sitting there, she's working on quantum computing. Quantum computing is a breakthrough kind of technology. If it works, it'll change the way we do computing. So that kind of, that kind of thinking is, is what we need to do. Um, companies are, have to, by their very nature, focus more attention on, on the nearer term things. It doesn't mean they shouldn't be investing in the future. And one of the reasons that Google was restructured into Alphabet was to separate out the long-term moonshot kinds of businesses that are still under development from the core Google business um, so that they weren't directly competing with one another because they're on such different timescales. Uh, universities have a remarkable advantage, though. They have the benefit of students. They have the benefit of the best and brightest young minds coming in, participating in research, coming with whole new ideas. When Larry and Sergey started on search, I said, well, you know, we have Alta Vista search engine. It's pretty good. I don't think there's a lot of opportunity to make it much better. But they looked at it and said, that's crummy. We can do a lot better than that. And they did. So that kind of willingness to relook at a problem under wholly different circumstances is, is what's critical. And let's talk specifically about Google or Alphabet's innovation lab. It's called the Moonshot Factory. Talk about what they're doing there and what your expectations are for that innovation lab. Well, they try to do things that are really long term. A number of them will probably fail. They either the technology won't work or the resulting technology won't be sufficiently compelling or or inexpensive enough to really work. But they try to do things that are far out, thinking about how you might use uh, hot air balloons, for example, to provide internet and communication services in parts of the world that don't have and are unlikely to get traditional hardwired uh, landlines uh, in place. Um, of course, uh, Waymo, the self-driving car vehicle, is a product of that uh, kind of activity uh, as well. Um, as is Verily, trying to build new kinds of uh, biomedical products that couple information technology with innovations to solve key um, human health problems. So we try to invest in things where we think there is an opportunity to really approach the problem differently. There's a transition that if you could get over this hump, the world is different on the other side of it. And you don't know when you start whether or not you'll be able to necessarily uh, get over it, but the possibility is there. So you chart an agenda for it and you take that group of people and you say, forget about the other 78,000 people who work at Google. You 2,000 people focus on this problem and go attack it. And that's the kind of incentive you need to get people really to go after kinds of problems. And how's Waymo going to make money? Well, we'll see. I mean, I think um, Waymo could make money in a variety of different ways, uh, whether I, I think probably it's not necessarily as a car manufacturer, it's as a partner probably with manufacturers of cars. Um, but I think there is now no doubt that we can build a self-driving car that drives better than 90% of the American drivers. Um, <laughs> excluding everybody, and, and I'm, will, I'm even going to not even count the people over 70 or under 20, um, or the people that have had something to drink. I mean, one of the most amazing things is if you look at the accident reports on Waymo, the most common accident is the self-driving car is rear-ended, and guess what the person has in their hand? <laughs> A phone. <laughs> More than half the time. So, uh, you know, here's your self-driving car. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about it. The car is going to ensure that the driving is well done. All right, related question from the audience. Can you comment on the impact of AI and machine learning on jobs and economic efficiency? Yeah, I think AI is going to, is going to have a significant impact. In the long term, AI will be a technology which ends up growing the economy and providing new opportunities. Just as the machine revolution, the industrial revolution in an earlier period 
provided greater opportunities. But the Industrial Revolution also caused dislocation of people involved in manual labor uh, that lasted over an extensive period of time. Now, the thing to understand about AI is it's going to move a lot faster than the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution required a lot of deployment of capital. You had to build machinery, blah, 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 blah. You just need computers for AI. Um, so it's going to cause that. It's going to cause um, what we sometimes uh, call de-skilling of certain jobs because certain jobs, some parts of them will be taken out by, by AI. That's going to require an investment in the country uh, and by employers in retraining of employees so that they can uh, do new work. I don't think we're going to eliminate all the doctors in the world and replace them with computers. Um, who in this room wants to sit down with a computer and hear a computerized voice tell them they have a terrible disease and it's going to be very difficult to treat? You want to sit down with the person who explains it to you. They may use the computer as a tool to do the analysis and get the data, but you don't want to sit down with the computer. So we're going to have new sets of jobs. I mean, given that we have an aging population, we could free up lots of talent to support that aging population. We could use more great school teachers in this country. Um, so there are things that I think people can do in really unique ways that technology is not even close to doing, even in the best imagination of somebody's AI. So let's talk about the Me Too movement. The mm -hmm. Economist this week is calling it, they say it could be the most powerful force for equality since wom women's suffrage. What is your take on the Me Too movement? My, my, my take is I think it's underlined the fact that we have a real problem in our country and that we have a, we have a historical track record of ignoring the, con the concerns that women have raised, that it's not just about sexual harassment and harassment in the workplace, it's more than that. It's about physical harassment and intimidation. Um, and I, I think it's a lesson for all of us. It's certainly a lesson for, for all the boys and young men about ways we need to do a b much better job of communicating with them and indicating with them uh, to listen, and that no means no, it doesn't mean something else. Uh, I think it is going to change, I think it is going to change society. Uh, things have been, after a long period, I mean, look, I'm a, I'm a product of, a, of an age where um, we, we were going to have an amendment that was going to ensure equal status for women, uh, and it didn't happen. Um, I think we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but I'm optimistic about the ability to move forward, and when I see the kind of um, young, promising, incredibly intelligent young women we're able to bring in to our scholarship program. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic about the future of women's leadership. What is your ratio there of women to men? I think we're 55% women. Uh, most of our, m most of our uh, engineering is mostly women. The engineers in the program are mostly women. Um, and so we asked ourselves, how do we get so many great women? They're just better people, I think, in the end. <laughs> I, I think something about the program, the way the program is structured, its notion that we're looking for people who are not only excellent, but are going to do something that will positively impact others, I think is something that attracted a really unique cohort of young people. That's, that's very admirable, 55% yeah. are women, wonderful. Thoughts on the infamous Google memo? And is, is everyone familiar with what this I'm talking about? This is the Demore memo? The, yeah. The, the Demore memo. So okay, so I have a long history in this area. Um, it actually goes back to an earlier period over a controversy that was initially ignited by some remarks that Larry Summers, then the president of Harvard, made. In an informal setting, he opined that perhaps women were not as well represented in STEM fields because if you look at the distribution on standardized math-like tests, um, there are more men at both extremes, by the way. Their curve doesn't peak as sharply as women's. It tends to be more spread out. So if you look at the very top high-end score where the tail is very thin, there tended to be more men. And he opined that this might be the difference, the reason for the difference. And it, he was trying to throw out a point for discussion, not necessarily saying he believed that was the only set of circumstances. But that was picked up 
by a bunch of pundits who said, well, you see, there is no discrimination. There are no societal barriers to women going into technical fields. It's purely that they're not as good. Um, so I then uh, communicated with uh, Shirley Tillman, who was then president of Princeton, a distinguished biologist, and Susan Hockfield, who was the president of MIT, also a distinguished biologist. And I said, we need to write an opinion piece about this. We need to write an opinion piece for our colleagues that say, we have lots of great women colleagues. They're completely capable of doing this kind of work. And things like that, that say there's some reason they can't do it, actually raise the societal barriers again, create stereotypes. So we wrote that, we, we wrote that piece and it got some airplay. Um, and uh, I think we got a lot of thank yous from our, from our colleagues in the field who really appreciated that we would take that point. So when the Demore memo came out, I was already on the record uh, on these things. And in fact, one of the things Demore does is he uses the research of somebody else and generalizes on that research about why there aren't as many women engineers at Google um, in that case. And the author of the research writes a follow-up note, says, you're misusing my work. You cannot, you cannot use statistical work and then apply it to the individual norms of dealing with individual peoples. So we wrote a, I wrote a piece at that time with my colleague Dave Patterson uh, and also with Maria Clawe, the president of Harvey Mudd, um, again pointing out that this was deja vu for us. We thought this problem had been put to bed and here we are wrestling with it again. Were you involved in the decision to fire? No, I was not. And do, management you do, you, do you agree with the decision to fire? It's a difficult, I think it's a difficult uh, decision. They wrestled quite hard. I think um, what the objection that was raised is that the memo actually created a situation that seemed to indicate that the women who were in engineering roles at Google were not there because they were capable of doing the work just as well as men. And that was considered deeply offensive by the women. I think it had, had he um, been willing to retract it and say I made a mistake and I shouldn't have done this and I shouldn't have put it on a company-wide uh, distribution list, I think there were lots of better uh, outcomes that could have been navigated there. Got it. So let's talk about your latest project, the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program, modeled on Cecil Rhodes scholarships. Uh, 50 or 49 in the end. 51, 51. Oh, it was 51. 51. Ah, okay, I read 49. Okay. <laughs> we're chosen for a new generation of leaders. Talk about that and how that, tell us from the beginning how you, Phil Knight from Nike and you you know, came up with this idea. Was it your idea that you proposed to him or was it more of a mutual decision? Yeah, it, I, well, I knew Phil was concerned about the issue of leadership. And he, um, he and I had become friends over the years and I knew this was something he was worried about. And I, uh, and this was near the end of my pre uh, presidency, right? And the uh, discussion over Brexit was just beginning. The refugee crisis in Europe was in full storm though. Um, the Arab Spring had collapsed, uh, and, and I felt, and some of the corporate things, I mean, 2008 had occurred in the financial crisis, there were some other corporate things that were stirring, and I just felt we had a leadership void. I've been an educator all my life, I've been associated with an institution that's an education institution, my natural thinking, how could a university make a better contribution? So then I went and looked at what had happened over the years with the Rhodes Scholars, and it was a pretty impressive list of people. I mean, Walter Isaacson himself, right? Mm -hmm. Bill Clinton, lots of distinguished leaders who've gone on to interesting and important careers, lots of academics, corporate leaders as well. And I said, well, why are all these things in Europe? Why don't we have a program like this in the US? And why not at Stanford, given its sort of unique blend of entrepreneurship and innovation and being on the West Coast? Um, so that was my initial idea. I talked to a group of trustees at the university. They liked it. So I went up to visit Phil. And I said, Phil, here's what we want to do. And here's the vision. And I said, he said, that sounds great. I said, Phil, I need $400 million. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, give me a month. And a month later, he said, I'm coming down to see you. And he came down and he said, um, are you willing to be the inaugural leader 
Uh, and can we share the name of the program? And if we can, we have a deal. So um, that was that was how uh, that was how it, it happened. And then we um, and was we put night the word out. Hennessy was that a key part? Rather yes, that than was Hennessy key part. night. Well, I did he get to go first? <laughs> he put in four hundred million. <laughs> I put in small by comparison. So he got to he got to choose the name, but he wanted to share the billing. He wanted to share the billing, and he's a smart person. He knows if you want somebody to really be committed to it, put their name on it. <laughs> so, um, but I'm committed because it's something I feel very strongly about, and you know, the scholars we've been able to attract from around the world are truly extraordinary, and they come from around the world, from the UK, from Afghanistan, uh, from China, from Italy. So they're really they're really incredible people, and so. Uh, we're delighted to have them, and I think if you ever want to be optimistic, they're sitting up here in the front row, talk to one of them, mm. because that's where the future is. That's exciting. So we have an audience question. Please comment on the move to put women on boards. And to so I've mandates. been a strong believer in board diversity. Um, uh, Google has adopted a version of the what's so-called Rooney Rule, which basically says if there's a board opening, you'll consider... Uh, a diverse slate of candidates in the finalists uh, for the board. Um, I'm not a fan of quotas uh, because I think they can be too rigid and sometimes a board needs somebody who's a financial expert or has some other particular expertise and a quota system can make it hard to manage and find the right uh, candidate. On the other hand, for a company like, like Alphabet or Google whose products touch all walks of life, Having a diverse board makes it more thoughtful about how you're developing those products, what they're doing, and how they're touching people's lives. And, and I think that's important. So audience question again, can you speak to the failure of leadership at Theranos? Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah, Elizabeth Holmes' Given company. Given that Elizabeth Holmes was a Stanford student. Uh, uh, she, she didn't finish her degree. <laughs> 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 Nor did Elon Musk. <laughs> yes, not, neither did Elon Musk. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, I knew Elizabeth a little bit, not very well. Uh, I had seen her a few times and met her a few times. I think she had an incredible vision. There were many technical challenges in achieving that vision. And I think, unfortunately, um, they found themselves in a situation where they uh, didn't have all the technical challenges conquered, and yet they wanted to move forward with building the company. So they had to build it in a way that ended up um, misleading people about what they were doing. And in the end, I think, unfortunately, harming people by sending out tests which were incorrect. So that's a, boy, that's a hard line. I don't know how you cross that line where you know you're sending out a medical test. I mean, they were sending out potassium tests to people that were way off. And a potassium test can tell somebody you're about to have a heart attack. And there was at least one young woman who, when the doctor got the results back, said, head to the hospital immediately. You're, you're going to have a heart attack any minute. That's a line that never should have been crossed at all. So I think things unraveled. Complicated, you know, the, uh, in the book, the relationship between uh, Sonny and, and Elizabeth is quite complicated, and who knows where, w where these missteps occurred. But it was a, it's a hard lesson for the Valley, and I think one we have, to, we have to take to heart. Absolutely. So we have time for just one last question. You quote Socrates on mm. reputation. Mm. You say, the way to a good reputation is to endeavor to be what you desire to appear. Dr. Hennessy, what do you desire to appear, and how has writing this book helped you shape it? So I, I'm a big believer in being authentic about that, that life is much easier if you try to take to people to a place and help lead them to a place where you really believe is the best place to go and where you believe they want to go despite the fact that the journey may be occasionally challenging. So uh, I want to be, in the end, um, somebody who invests in the next generation and helps make the world better 
through the, through the students we have at Stanford. And I think if we can do that, um, the world will be a better place and we can repair some of the damage that my generation uh, has, has done to the world. And if we can do that, it'll be a better world for, for my children and for my granddaughter. And that'll be a wonderful outcome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. So I hope you've all enjoyed this evening's program brought to you by the Commonwealth Club Silicon Valley. Again, we would like to thank Dr. John Hennessy, author of Leading Matters, Lessons from My Journey. Our audience here in Palo Alto, you've been awesome. And those of you joining us online or on the radio. And now this meeting is adjourned. <laughs> so we're going to have a book signing um, to your left. Um, John will be signing books, so bring your books up and um, enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you, John. Appreciate it. Would you? Would you